Buckle up for AEC Trailblazers, the Founders Files, where we crack open the stories of the brightest minds in the AEC startup scene. Forget institutional pitches, while diving deep into the real personal journeys of these industry disruptors. Get ready for some casual chats firsthand. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another episode of the Trailblazers podcast, where we interview the most amazing founders of the AEC. Here with us is René Marcos. He is the founder and CEO of Alice Technologies. He obtained his PhD in artificial intelligence applications for construction as a Charles H. Devil Fellow at Stanford University. He's a second generation civil engineer with over 15 years of construction industry experience divided between industry and academia. With the launch of Alice, René introduced the industry to a paradigm shift in construction scheduling and is on a mission to empower the construction industry with AI-powered generative construction scheduling technology to de-risk capital projects and recover from delays. René is a passionate mountaineer who relishes to chal the challenge of conquering new peaks. Hi, René. Welcome. Hi, Valentin. Thanks for the introduction. Did I miss something on the intro? I teach. I teach at Stanford. Yeah, well, that was great. Yeah. Uh, I love that you say, like, I teach Stanford like like it's just another thing. <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was probably the hardest one. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's also it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. I I, I like the, the the theory and the and the academia, and I, I like that atmosphere in a lot of ways. I, I love it because typ typically when you're an entrepreneur, right? Like most of your time, you're dealing with practical stuff, right? Dealing dealing with the challenges you get every day. Uh, but when you're teaching, it's more theory than than actually practice. So. Um, it's interesting how you how you deal with that um, balance between one and the other. Yeah, it's, it's I think um, it's a great question. And so the the interplay of theory and practice. So something that Stanford has done very very well since inception is they basically said, hey, we don't want to we don't want to educate people that are like cultured and they know a lot of stuff. We want to educate people that are practical. And so I think like Stanford has my department at Stanford SIFE, Stanford Integrated Facility Engineering. Uh, CIFE.stanford.edu. Um, they do a lot of research and they have 40 companies that are partnered with the department. And those companies that are partnering with the department, um, they, um, those companies that are partnering with the department um, bring a lot of industrial practice to, uh, bring a lot of industrial practice to uh, what we do. And when I did my PhD, I actually told my advisor I want to do six months work, six months study. And that's one reason why I think the PhD ended up being so uh, applicable. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't think that there's a... The world thinks there's a big difference between theory and practice. Ultimately, what is the theory for if it's not for practice? And that, that, that I think is kind of why people maybe look down upon it. But um, yeah, I really think that if you, if you give it the time or if, if you push the theory towards being practical, then you can do some really like, amazing things and fun things with it. That's something that uh, sometimes is more uh, easier said than done. Like we we have worked with a lot of like P PhD students or, or people that have put together papers and, and they come to you and they're like, you know what, I have this paper. Can you just develop this for me? And, and we're like, sure. And they always say, we already developed all the practical stuff. You just need to, need to put the code on a platform. It's going to work. And... <laughs> In most cases, it never works because it's just, you know, a specific piece of a specific situation. But then when you bring that to reality, it's much more yeah. complex. Um, but but something like that happened to you, right? Because you, you did, Alice, when you were doing your PhD, the idea of Alice came when you were doing your, your PhD or that was afterwards? The idea of Alice came when I was doing my PhD. Uh, yeah, well... I was in Afghanistan. I was given, I was working as a private contractor. And so uh, they gave me, I think, 30 people. And they, I was supposed to build these landing strips for F-16s. So I was doing that. And then uh, 
the I couldn't figure out the right sequencing. It, it sounds it looks, like super stupid, right? Like what the heck? It's just a simple, you know, it's a large slab, but who cares? And I kept like thinking, hey, there's got to be a tool that can do that. There's got to be a tool that can sequence things for you. And so I went to Stanford to I went to Stanford to find it, and then I ended up building it. And so that's kind of how. So yes, the idea came to me. I was I was looking for it, so I was, I was searching for that idea before I, I started my PhD. But during the PhD, I sort of you know finalized it. Yeah. Uh, is and and before we dive into Alice, I, I, every time uh, I interview someone, I go and uh, listen to all the podcasts they have done, the interviews and everything. And <laughs> your life is extremely interesting, man. Like you have been all over the place um, and you got to create the, one of the most amazing companies on, on the AC. So um, can, can you tell us a little bit of, of, of your early life? I don't know. I had so much pleasure on, 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 on learning that that I want the audience to, to get that pleasure as well. Yeah, I think like I, I was born in Prague. My dad's Lebanese, my mom's Czech. They escaped communism. They ended up uh, in the Lebanese war. Uh, and then um, we spent the first five years in the Lebanese War, which was a very intense experience. Uh, and then we escaped that. We ended up in Dubai. I uh, went to an international high school. And then uh, I went to Beirut, got my undergraduate degree. Uh, interestingly enough, I didn't like class. So I'd always cut class to go and, like, I would volunteer in a construction project. And so, uh, yeah, basically I would cut class, go volunteer in construction projects. But then um, I basically uh, decided to go to Afghanistan. So uh, I basically decided to kind of walk away from this like relatively comfortable life. My dad had built a group of companies at the time. I instead went to Afghanistan. I um, worked there for 13 months, uh, managed 114 people, designed, built, and procured my own jobs from A to Z. Um, yeah, it was a pretty pretty like unique remarkable experience professionally and personally yeah um did that ended up uh went to usc ended up at stanford again six months on six months off here on the program um yeah i like to climb mountains on occasion um that's kind of the story is that the is that the story yeah. <laughs> yeah that 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 was uh a good start for sure. Um, 140 people uh, on a construction site. What what you were building in in Afghanistan? <laughs> uh, I mean, private contractors. You pay us, we build it. Uh, we did a school for the Vatican, military bases, radio towers, offices. Uh, first project I was I ever got to, to build was a bar out of airplane wings. A crashed airplane in in Kabul, Afghanistan airport, and they wanted a bar out of it. So that was the first thing I did. Yeah, and then by the end, I built a, built a base for the the British. Yeah. Interesting. I think the the peak of your career is building that bar, man. Like nothing, <laughs> nothing is going to be <laughs> cool that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing's no. going to be cool. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that statement. Yeah, nothing's going to be cool than the the, the bar. Yeah. <laughs> It was uh, there's this crazy major German guy, I forget his name, and he'd have these like crazy ideas. He's like, you know what I want? I want a fountain. And I'm like, man, you're in a military base in Afghanistan. Like, dude, no, we're gonna have a fountain. I'm like, it's minus twenty, it's gonna freeze. No, we'll put antifreeze in it. I'm like, okay, you know, fine. Yeah, so we we ended up building a little fountain actually, that was nice. Oh really? That was a, a real thing. Yeah, he wanted a fountain. I, I'm not sure if I if I love a client like that or I hate it or, or kind of both. <laughs> I mean, in, in a place like Afghanistan, it was so like barren that I think just having someone that's having fun like was awesome. Yeah. Especially on a military base, like the military folks like tend to do things to the T. Right? That's so having somebody that was like actually like trying to make things fun. Hey, it was great. And then. After all that fun, um, we're not going to bring the, the bar again, but uh, even if you sell Alice, I'm going to remember you for the bar, man, not for Alice. Just kidding. 
<laughs> yeah, why not? Doesn't matter. Uh, but, but then when, when you came with on, on the US, you did your PhD in, you, you decided this is a great idea. I'm just going to build a company or how was the process from going from the, the actual idea to uh, raising money and all the... Yeah, great question. Um, for me, I entered a competition on campus. So there's a big entrepreneurship business competition. So we won first place. We voted the best product coming out of Stanford University back in 2014. And so they gave us $20,000. That $20,000, then uh, I used it to raise more money and more money. And then, you know, and here we are, you know, $60 million later. Easy. That, you, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> Right, like it? Oh man, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely, <laughs> definitely not. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's. There's, there's a lot of volatility, a lot of, a lot of stuff that's like, yeah. It's, uh, it's a, it's a stressful environment that you're in. Yeah, yeah and even more in, on the AC because I've met a lot of folks, you know, other entrepreneurs that come from other industries that. You know, like financing the early uh, 2010 or something like that, it was so easy to like raise money. But that that never happened in the AC. In the AC, has never been easy to raise money from from investors. Um, yeah, when I started in 2015, there like people would just laugh at me. You know, like construction, like what I wouldn't touch that with a tension pole. Like literally, like why are you wasting my time? I had VCs that literally stopped me within three minutes of talking to them and said like hey i don't i don't want to talk to you i don't do i don't do construction i don't want to um yeah i don't yeah um it started to change in 2017 2018 you know brick and mortar was one of the first ones um you know today actually i think that that uh the construction tech is a thing you know i'm on a, I'm on a whatsapp group there's like 78 people on it which is insane right so i think uh to answer it like I don't know if I agree with the statement that it's it's not easy. I think it's definitely gotten a hell of a lot easier uh, over the last decade. This is absolutely, I guarantee that. Um, like when I was trying to raise 2015, 16, it was just like I mean, pe people were just looking at me like, like what? Like who are you? Like what? Like we do like AI and data and like you know algorithms. Like a lot with construction, like shovels and like bulldozers. Like no. Um, so yeah, I think. You know, it's 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 not easy now, right? And it never is, right? I mean, you know, there there are there are companies and people out there that like, yeah, you you, you have a good idea and you run bump the right people at the right time, but even then, right? Like most companies I know, and when I say that, I mean like ninety nine, ninety eight percent of the companies I know or the founders I know have very very difficult periods in their company's history. You know, money's running out, and the top client left, and something's blowing up, and you can't raise money. And one of the investors that said they gave you term sheet change their mind. Like, just lots of stuff is cooking and happening. So, yeah. Oh, I can agree on that for sure. Like, no, no entrepreneur is 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 gonna be a just a fun, always a fun ride. Like. I I guess Elon Musk described it once as for him it was like a lot of pain, pain, moments of pain, problems, pain, problems. And then once in a while you get these really beautiful moments when you get good news and and but then suddenly the next day is bad news again. Pain, exactly pain, it. pain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly, that's exactly it. Yeah. If you if you don't like I mean that's kinda of also the thing, I think a lot of people get like I've been doing this for ten years, and and you, you don't do something for ten years unless there's some underlying cause for what you're doing. I think most people don't like. Here, here's something an interesting thought: most people don't realize that all the you know the CEO of Nvidia, and Elon Musk, and whatever Facebook, like all of these people had an exit opportunity at some point. They had multiple exit opportunities. They could have sold it for whatever, 100 billion, 10 billion, whatever it is. Like, there was several points where they could have sold it. 
And um, uh, they said no. And so that's kind of what I'm realizing is that the, that inevitably there's just there's a lot of there's a lot of pain for a long time, and if maybe it's better to focus on on if you like that, then then you have like a magic secret that's invincible, you know. If you and I've seen it, if you're an entrepreneur that's every day thinking about the exit, right? you wake up in the morning, yeah, man, I got a I need, I need ten million, whatever. There's always a number. You know, fill in the blank number of million dollars, right? But uh, if if you're doing that, it's it works when the doing going's good. It can be very very painful when the going is not good. Yeah. Oh, I I agree on that, and. A lot of people, I think, sometimes think because you see these big entrepreneurs, which are not the norm, right? 99.999 are smaller entrepreneurs. Like, you only get to be there if you're extremely smart, lucky, and so many other variables need to happen. Mm -hmm. But but even then, uh, and they think because it's, they're managing these big companies, they have a lot of money. But truth is... Like, e even if you do that, your prog problems are as big as your money. So it's not that you have a a more quiet and easier life just because you have money or because you have a big company. That that never happens. That never happens. And uh, at least in my experience, every time we, we have grown on the company is, like, I still enjoy it. But the bigger you are, the, the harder you can fall. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think that most people don't realize, like, uh, Nvidia's unofficial motto was, "We are thir we are thirty we are always thirty days away from running out of money." Right, and that, that was literally an unofficial motto. Um, when uh, when uh, the CEO gave a talk at Stanford earlier this year, he, he said, "I wish you more pain," you know, <laughs> which is a uh, you know, I think that, yes, you always have an existential way. Like, I think one of the things that changes is the early in the business, you, you go from like, oh, I'm worth a billion, zero, billion, zero, billion, zero. That's six times a day. And then it becomes every like week. And then it's every three weeks. And then, you know, now at, uh, we're at Series B. Um, uh, it starts to become every three, four months, right? And so the the, 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 the curve gets longer. But there's still a curve, right? And even for us, like we sort of joke, we're like, "Hey, we're on the up, we're on the up." Uh oh, oh, well, that was fun. Now it's going. You know, there's all this, and and it's it's natural, right? I think that most people don't realize that that like you're just unlocking the next layer of problems, and then when you unlock that next layer, you unlock the next layer. That's you unlock cool the next layer, you solve it, yeah. and unlocks the. So you're like, ah, everything's going great, but now you run into the issues. You know, scale is super interesting too, right? So it's, 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 it's like yeah. games. You know, games. You mm -hmm. you get new skills, and then suddenly it's like I can kill all the monsters, or I can do all this. But then you're on a new level, and yeah. things are much harder, and you're in the same place again. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like that. It's a good way of of describing it. Mm -hmm. um, but but then go, going back to uh, what Alice does, which for, for me, I, I wish I uh, we could have used it back then. I, I used to be the uh, te technology lead for a big casino in Vegas. Um, and I remember there was just a room on, on the office. There was the room for the people that were putting together and updating the schedule. It was like mm -hmm. four, five poor souls all the time just doing that. And for me, it's like, this is insane. And they were manually like updating a Primavera that every time they printed, it was more than 300 or 400 pages. So for me, it was like, this is insane. Like, this, this should be a better way to do this. Uh, and then uh, we definitely this. think so. Yeah, that's what we created <laughs> Alice for. It's a parametric scheduler. So you can change, like, the, the question I always ask myself, like, think about it, right? If you have a schedule, shouldn't you be able to tell the schedule, hey, add a crane? What happens if I delay, have a delay? What happens if I resequence? Do I, should I try overtime? Or should I add resources? Or should I 
change one of the milestones or whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, with with our system, with the first system in the world, you can just simply tweak it. We just recently released in February a completely new uh, new technology. And so you can now ingest an existing Primavera P6 file. You can ingest a, um, a Primavera file. You can ingest a, a Microsoft Project file. And then within a few minutes, you can hit simulate and the software will auto automatically uh, optimize it for you. It will add a crane, add a crew, try overtime, try resequencing. Uh, this is a bunch of really cool tricks we can do for oil and gas customers, for example. You can uh, limit the number of people in each zone to account for work density for um, the, for, I guess, for, um, uh, for um, you know, commercial contractors, we can use production rates and uh, quantities. Uh, for infrastructure, you can sort of vary the number of resources in each task. So it's really like... Um, if there's a delay, you can update progress, resequence around intelligent delay, uh, auto runs. It, it's a it's a completely different paradigm. Right? So you you know people that are used to scheduling are like, hey, I have the static system that every like I have to really manually churn everything and delete arrows and redraw arrows and all that sort of stuff. With Alice, you just press the button. <laughs> oh man, like you can imagine the hours I. I used to help these guys uh, do exactly that. Like every every time there was a delay, and there are always delay, there are always delays, and you spend so much time updating it, and you make so many mistakes updating it. So it, it, it's really cool what you're doing with this new feature. But I, I'm also curious, like, do, do you create like an AI model with historical data for that, or where do you pull the data from to like? Mm. Um, make the adjustments to the whole schedule? I'm going to say something that's probably a little bit controversial, but um, neural networks uh, have some very, very important positive properties. And those are that you don't need to explain to a neural network how to solve the problem. It's amazing. You give it 10,000 images of cats, and on 10,000 first image, it tells you cat or no cat. But you never have to explain to it what makes a cat a cat. Um, Neural networks have two important downsides. It cannot tell you how it solved the problem. The answer is in the, the, you know, the 10,000, 100 million parameters, or whatever the numbers are, right? It doesn't make logical sense to humans. And neural networks are never 100% accurate. And so to answer a question, um, I do not believe you should use an LLM to schedule. It does not make any sense. You don't need an LLM to run a calculator. We have calculators. We have constraint modelers. Right? This is what we have. Um, the um, the so th using old data to generate to schedule for you doesn't make sense. I think there is a possibility to use old data to create the list of tasks that you want scheduled. But we have a highly developed algorithm or a set of many algorithms that we've combined together to take ingest information and schedule it for you. And so we do not use past data to generate what we want. We actually take what the scheduler has, has created and then we run that through our algorithms. Uh, also importantly, don't think that that data is available, truthfully, like in our field. You know, there's companies like Nplan, and we're, we're good friends with those guys. They have, uh, I think, 700,000 schedules in their database. But running those schedules, like to create something that's useful, it's not easy. No, that that, that makes sense. There, there are so many variables and uniqueness to each project that 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 makes sense. Um, interesting. And if may I ask, when you adjust on a schedule? or updated the schedule, what's the accuracy of, of the schedule you provide? 100%. And what I mean by that is that, that one second, let's be clear, garbage in is garbage out. But if you give me a schedule, I will guarantee, unlike any system in the world, that the constraints are resolved to 100%. We do not over-allocate resources. We do not valid, uh, violate precedents. We do not violate calendars, right? 
And so oftentimes when we ingest schedules, the first thing we do is we do a check and take a wild guess at how many times out of 10 we find things in the schedule that don't add up. One of the classic things we do is we take a schedule, we say, hey, you guys are using resources, great. Um, FYI, your existing schedule is over allocating resources. You think you, you only have 10 crews available, your schedule is using 14. Would you like us to run it with 10? Yeah, we run it with 10. We're like, heads up, you guys are already 90. You haven't started the project, you're 90 days late. So the, the constraint resolution we have, or, or the, the ability to like, here's what I'm building, here's the rules for what I'm building, we basically, on it, like, those rules will be satisfied no matter what. Interesting. Mm -hmm. What 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 would you say are the or where do you feel it's the biggest impact on on your clients? That I, I guess mo most of your clients are GCs or owners. I guess GCs, owners, consultants. Yeah, those are the three big buckets. And 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 then on 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 them, wh where do you feel? the having this way of creating schedules has the, the the biggest impact in in the project so which of the three three players that i named are finding the biggest impact is that the question well the, the question is on and we can separate it by player but um it could be the same for for the three of them but um where where do you see the the biggest impact uh, after you implement it after they ran it on the on the first project where is the biggest impact? Um, it's a good question. Because uh, the, the other way you could phrase the question is, you know, is it in pre-construction or bidding pre-construction construction? Um, we definitely see like pre-award um, in pre-construction, you get a lot of benefit from it because it, it, it helps you simulate a, a number of things early. The, the cost of changing how you're building it is still zero. Uh, and so the, the impact of your decisions is greatest. Um, I don't know if I can tell you like each of the each of the phases and each of the players has a specific use case that's that's valuable and they're willing to pay us for. Um, consultants like it because they can uh, they can adjust the schedule and then be very smart about what to do with that schedule. Right? They can adjust the schedule and say, "Hey, uh, Mrs. Owner or Mrs. GC." We have all of these these things that we found wrong with your schedule, and we have all of these things like here's some suggestions how you can improve it and so on. From an owner perspective, uh, one of the key things we're seeing is that what owners really like is the ability to, um, if if they're having a conversation with a GC, that conversation now is based on some mathematical and numeric uh, basis, and so they can go to the GC and say, hey, we we don't think the schedule is achievable. And here's why. Alternatively, for example, what they could say is, is um, well, um, what about accelerating? What are the options for acceleration? Let's have a conversation around that and what is the best way forward. Right? Uh, from a GC perspective, obviously what you're doing is minimizing risk. You're, you're much more confident in the schedule that you have. And you're also like the resilience of it, the ability to absorb change, to resequence around delays. Right? That's kind of what we offer. Interesting, and I even saw that you get um, you, you have the possibility to take data from BIM models and then uh, take that into a, a project schedule, right? Correct. We originally built a BIM-based simulator. That was the original software. So you would ingest the BIM, and then you would set the constraints up on the BIM, and then hit simulate and run it for you. Yeah. Interesting, and. and uh, when I saw that, I was I was also curious because, like, like you mentioned, is sometimes you you don't even have a full design or or a you don't even have CDs or anything. Um, when you start all, uh, creating your your schedule, right, to visualize how the process is mm -hmm. going to be, and I'm just curious how how the process works when typically you create first a schedule and then the BIM model. Yeah. Um, Amazing question. Um, here's what we learned. It doesn't really matter. First of all, no project has all the information. 
period. That we have never encountered a project that has 100% of all the information. Uh, second, uh, if your design is not complete, like we've run projects where we literally put boxes on top of each other. Box for floor one, box for floor two, box for floor three, and you can run it on that. Um, at the end of the day, you're building a constraint model, and that constraint model is dynamic. It can change, it can absorb, it can resequence, it can do a whole bunch of stuff, right? Um, the, um, the other thing that we're currently, we're about to release in the next uh, six weeks is something we call visual WBS. And so the ability to visually, uh, visually change, uh, visually show the WBS on top of a PDF drawing. And so what you can do with that, we, you know, everything that we're running is, is conceptual level scheduling that then increases in level of detail to become, you know, level three, level five, you know, production level schedules. And so Alice falls what we call dynamic level of detail. So maybe to summarize what I'm trying to say is that, um, to summarize what I'm trying to say is that you don't need, no project has all the information. Uh, Alice is a constraint based solver. And so it doesn't really care how you set those constraints up. You can set it up using boxes if you want to work in 3D, and you can set it up using bubble diagrams if you want to work in 2D. And the, bo the, the boxes in 3D we originally started with were about to release a 2D diagram visualization of it. Um, the name of the game for us these days is speed. When we started the company, the name of the game was like, hey, can we do it? Can we even get this thing to work? Now it's speed. So our, our setup time these days is 30 minutes, I don't know, 15, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. It's fast, super fast. And people learn how to use it in like, uh, like 30 minutes, an hour. Yeah. That's fast for a, for a, for something as complex as this, like not even Primavera. Uh, Primavera sometimes people end up doing a training for a week or two until they, they uh, understand how it works. Yeah. So. To, to be clear, the numbers I'm giving you are for people that are familiar with scheduling. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a scheduler and you've used whatever it is, Pasta, Microsoft Project, or Primavera, whatever, like whatever it is, yes, you will be, you'll pick it up in 30 minutes. If you have no scheduling background, uh, it's a little bit longer. Yeah. Well, it, it makes sense. It's obvious. It's like, Never managing, never using a CRM, and then suddenly you have to use one. It's not the same as having experience with multiple CRMs and then mm -hmm. just dealing with a new one that things might be similar in some sort of way. Um, oh, that, that that that's makes sense. And 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 in terms of the future, um, we're speaking about schedules. We need to speak about the future. Um, what what are your plans for for our Alice? Like we already mentioned, what type of data you get, um, what you do is mm. your idea is to what work with other stakeholders or start ingesting data another way, improving yeah. more the speed. We, there, we have yeah, we have we have a lot, we have a number of initiatives that are like super super exciting. So the world currently schedules in what I call one D list of tasks. Uh, what we built originally with Alice is scheduling in 3D using a BIM model. What we're releasing in the next six, six to eight weeks is Alice 2D. The reason that's significant is that what I think you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with a, a world where you can go from 1D to 2D to 3D and back and forth across this, across this spectrum. So that's one. Two, we're releasing something called intelligent rescheduling or resequencing. And so when there's updates, you update progress. Currently, Alice will will tweak what it's doing to to to, to maintain that that um, to, to to schedule around the delay or mitigate the delay or or absorb the the changes that are happening. What we want to release is the ability to intelligently do that, and so to say, hey, I can change anything you want for the next two months, but then get me back on track. So that's also, I think, a major major shift forward. Uh, given everything that's happening with uh, generative AI. Uh, we are about to release something that then compares the simulations that you did. So explains to you why certain simulations are faster than other simulations. What are the chain between them and tells the to you in English. 
And then the third thing that we're doing is the ability to automatically run the scheduler for you, which I think is phenomenal, right? It's really, really, really cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Those are, I think I named like four separate things that are each one of them a substantial shift forward in terms of technological ability uh, in the field. And that's coming out that's in the next like eight, eight weeks, actually. Oh, really? So all mm. of them are coming in eight weeks? Yeah. The, the auto runs are, maybe they were released today or yesterday. The, the LLM comparison is coming out in the month. The 2D visualization aspect of it is coming out also in the next like eight weeks. And um, I don't know if I missed one, but yeah, all in the next like eight weeks. That's, oh, the intelligent that's rescheduling. Impressive. That one's actually longer. Intelligent rescheduling, maybe like 10, 12 weeks out. But then the next like two months, like it's, and e the, what's really, really exciting is each one of these is like a completely different way to think about scheduling. You know, like having, like ingesting a schedule and then just hitting, you run it for me. You tell me what, what I can do here. So I think it's fascinating. Right. Or, or it, you're going like, you know what? Okay. Tell me, tell me why, what do I need to know about the schedule? Explain it to me. Yeah. It, it's, it sounds so obvious that that's the way it should be, but, but, but I, I was just going back to my, to my past life when we we're dealing with schedules and it, it's true. It's such a, like 1D or linear process where you just, work on on a on a on one thesis of how the schedule is gonna be and that's it it's like a static thing in working in construction right typically or or design you never do that right on design you try different designs you analyze it the ups mm -hmm. and downs the whys or, so it's it's now that you're mentioning it's so stupid the way that we're doing it because it's it's just it in you lose so much money on that. It, it might sound Valentina, like that's just, exactly that's God. exactly it. It's like there's there's a lot of ways to build a construction project. One cranes, two cranes, one hotel, one hotel, etc. The truth of the matter is it, it's not a, a, it is not a correct statement to say that there's millions of ways to build a project because a human will tell you, hey, that doesn't make sense. I don't need twenty cranes to build a parking lot. But what the human will do is, is eliminate you know maybe six choices for a given variable down to two. And that's all, every project I've been on, there's usually these two or three, you know, like, do we want to build it core first or do we want to, you know, do we want to do core out or do we want to do ABC or is it BCA? Like, there's always these two, three questions, right? And, and the problem today is that every time somebody asks a question, it takes you, in some cases, a few hours, in some cases, a few weeks, depending on what it is that you're asking. But the, like... At some point, you run out. Like I don't, I don't, I don't have three weeks to wait for this. So I'm going to make a gut sense call. I'm going to go with it. And this is what Alice, for the first time ever, offers. It's the ability. And what we just released is, is I think something amazing, which is we took all the knowledge of all the algorithms that we had for 3D and we plugged it into an existing schedule. We ingested P6 and we just hit simulate, and it and it just it works. And you can now actually definitively answer that. You can run like when someone says, "Hey." Should we be building it with two TBMs, tunnel boring machines? Yes. Why do you say that? Well, I've tried it. Here's here's what I ran with one. Here's what I ran with three. Here's what I ran with four. And our best for us, yeah, the cost to time ratio is higher, but but it's worth it because of the fact that we need to deliver. You know, but you can now have a, a, a mathematically grounded conversation around these things. And we like to say we, we change schedulers to planners and planners to strategists. You now have the ability to basically run a number of these scenarios and simulations and then go back to the project team and say, hey, here's the best way to build it. And I know this because I've tried these six other ways to do it. That, that's a, a great point you, you, you bring, Rene, that like for sure, it's like the same, like design, right? The, the, it's never going to happen that you press a button and then automatically you will get the design of your building. That that will never happen. Like you need an interaction with the machine of like, you know what, I, I, I want to build in this three type of buildings. I want this 
then maybe I want to combine the uh, facade of this building with the core of this one and and having the the ability to do that on 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 the scheduling you might get like you said three three different options you choose mm -hmm. one but then you might say you know what I like the 50% of the, the way the schedule starts and I can select the, the the starting of the process and then say you know what for the rest iterate on that because I know this part is perfect yeah. but I need just this piece to be modified so yeah it's interesting we have like the, this discussion we have a lot internally at the company the, the more flexibility of the algorithm the more it can explore the more it can optimize but it can also give you stuff that you don't like the solution doesn't make sense the more you constrain it the better your solutions are going to look but there's you're losing on the optimization side so this philosophical battle between optimize and realize right is something that, that we spend a lot of time on and i think we've you know we found a really really good balance right between those two two worlds yeah oh i'm glad you you're discussing i think everybody who is trying to provide ways of simulating anything on the construction industry is having the same conversations like should should i simulate everything and and yeah, it will be perfect, but it might not be the exact solution that the client needs. Mm -hmm. Or should it just leave it open for for the user to just do whatever they want and and end up with like, I don't know. ChatGPT is a good example, right? Like you, you, anybody can use it, and you can even ask for uh, code to be a software developer. That means that you're going to be a software developer and that you're going to get the right answers. No, because you need to ask the right questions, have a lot of knowledge to actually get, it's, it's like you said, garbage in, garbage out. So so you need a, an in-between, like like a good balance between, like, you know what, you're not going to do whatever you want, but at the same time, you have, you're going to have certain flexibility. So when you, you think that's the right solution because you, you have been in construction for a long time, so you, mm -hmm. you can see what works and then iterate on, on top of that. That's that's why we released that's why we released Alice Core. So with our current system right now, is you can really like span the, the gamut of, of those questions. Right? Do I want to optimize specifically, or do I want to optimize broadly? And do I want to use an existing schedule as my start? Do I want to use a BIM as a start? Like with our system, you can really do it. Whatever, like you, you tell me, hey, I want to spend six weeks building out a model, and I want to optimize the the the, the hell out of it. We have a system that can do that for you. Great. You say, you know what? I, I don't have six weeks. I got, I don't have six hours. I have 60 minutes. Okay. Here's what we can do in 60 minutes. Um, and everything in between. Yeah. It's the oh, first, it's that. kind of fascinating. It's the first constraint based system in our field. And so what it means is you can actually like the thing that's beautiful about constraints is you can add, like you can, Add and remove them. They're, they're like additive. And so you, you don't have to worry about if I add a crane in overtime, I have to figure out. <laughs> Construction. It's, it's, a con it's a saw or something like that? Oh, no, that was a, a fire truck. Oh, fire truck. It sounded here, it sounded like. Yeah, what I was saying is that we built the first constraint-based system in construction. And the thing that's beautiful about constraints is they're additive. So if, if you have a, a, a group of constraints that govern your project, and I have a new constraint, I just simply add it to the constraint pile. And I hit simulate. You, you the software, figure out how all of these things interact together. If I add a crane, I just simply say add crane, we simulate. I don't have to think about, oh, the crane affects all of these things. And I have to, like, I'm not the one that's actually doing the scheduling. I'm not the one that has to propagate that change. I just simply tell it this is a change. And now with this, this ability, we brought that to the existing P6 systems. We've already done it in the past to BIM. And we've also now in, in, introduced, you know, auto runs, Gen AI, LLM comparisons, and 2D, which is, like, mind-blowing. And that's all coming out in, like, the next... Literally six day weeks. The good thing is, it's I was visualizing myself if I had to do the work, 
and it's a complete change of paradigm because it's not just saying you know any a small incremental change of hey i used to do things on on a desktop app and now i'm doing it on the cloud yes it's better sure but you can still keep doing it on on the desktop and it's not going to be a huge difference but here we're we're speaking about uh, like someone coming to a new job site and saying like no if you're not doing it this way like it's there is no other way. You have to use. We, we're seeing, yeah, like we're, we're seeing for, with this new system we released for the first time. Schedulers, I literally got an. I had a conversation with um, one of the largest construction companies in Brazil. So I got on the call and I said, "Hey, you've been using the software for two months. What, what do you think?" And the guy said, "You know, Renee, Alice is a one-way street." I was like, "Okay, what, what does that mean?" And he said, "I can't imagine my career without Alice." Everything's so much faster. Everything's so much like more powerful. So I think that was really, really amazing. Yeah. That's a good way of us closing with 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 the podcast. Uh, the best the best thing a uh, uh, owner of a company or owner of a product like, like yourself is is hearing something like that. So I I know you're a busy man. You do a lot of things. So. Uh, not going to take uh, more of your time, but before we wrap this up, can I ask you a couple of uh, ping pong questions? Yeah, ask me. Ask away. <laughs> All right. So can you tell a great AC software? AEC? Yeah, AC software. Any, any Trunk tools. Oh, the greatest. Trunk tools. Yeah, trunk.tools. Check it out. Super, yeah. super powerful right. technology. Yeah. I'm sure they're, they're the first and in, in, uh, the first to unlock this paradigm for the industry. All right. Yeah. I will. And answer any question. You can literally upload all your documentation unstructured and then ask it any question that answers it. Oh, I saw a presentation in, uh, in uh, LA. Like, mm-hmm. uh, like, I think it was like two months ago or something like that. Yeah. I know the guys we were speaking about. Yeah. That was really cool. It is. True. I didn't know that the the name. Um, all right, the next big trend in DAC. Next big trend. Yeah. Oh, it's it's, it's 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 uh, you know bringing LLMs to our field. I mean, that's really what's, what's going to happen. Yeah. But I think you're going to see a lot of interesting applications in terms of data summarization, aggregation, interaction, so on and so forth. I think that's like yeah, it's going to be super super exciting. Mm. Absolutely. If you could collaborate with any person uh, in history, which person would you choose? Uh, Einstein, Heisenberg, Schrodinger. I don't know if it really makes a difference which one of the three it would be, right? Well, you said collaborate. I don't know if they'd want to collaborate with me, right? <laughs> well... Let's say they, they want. Let's say they want. amazing. I mean, I'll make them coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I I think they don't have an option now. I they're, they're not even alive. So you said any person in history. Any person, yeah. any person in history. Those, those are my choices. Yeah. No, good choices. Um, and finally, what's your favorite building in the world? And have you ever visited? Favorite building? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, give me a second to think. I like the Infinity Tower in Dubai. I like it because it's a, it's a, it's a, I think a 50 story building that, that rotates. And the, I, my friend designed it, Victor Gain. And so I've seen a lot of the math and the parametric design that goes into it. And it's like really super, super, it's a, it's a beautiful piece of mathematics is the way I'd say it. Uh, and so I'm, I'm familiar with the inner workings of how that building came together. And the, he explained to me that the, the balconies are different lengths so that it gives the illusion of water rippling down the building, which I thought was a, like just a very, very cool idea. So yeah, the infinity tower in Dubai. Love the, the mix when they mix, uh, something more of, of philosophical com- yeah. with mathematics. It's, it's mm-hmm. just perfect. It just yeah. Works. yeah. 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 And he's uh, he's like the architect engineer. Yeah. Like just very, 
very creative. So, cool. All right. Before we say goodbye bye to each other, can you uh, tell the audience where they can know more about um, Alice and yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, AliceTechnologies.com or just shoot me an email, Renee at AliceTechnologies.com. I'm always happy to chat to anybody that's interested in the magical world of uh, generative scheduling. Great. Thanks so much for, for being here, Rene. It was so great learning about what you're doing. And like I told you, you're changing the paradigm on, on the industry. So thanks for improving our industry so much. Thank you, Valentin. Thanks for inviting me. Great to be here. Thanks to our listeners. If you like this content, you can find past and upcoming episodes in asuworks.evers.com and at all of our Evers social media. We'd love to hear from you and recommendations for new content, so leave us a DM and we'll make sure to catch it.